channel, what we want to do is um, we want to talk about this youth peace and security agenda. Uh, maybe start with looking at the genesis of this agenda, um, then look at some of the challenges and opportunities, uh, the intersections with other global agendas. I already mentioned the Women, Peace and Security agenda, but there's of course also very importantly the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and uh, lastly, we also want to focus on what is happening here in the UAE because I think there are some very interesting lessons and practices that are um, being deployed here in the UAE where others could learn. So let's start first maybe with the genesis of this agenda. And I would like to turn to both Ashaleke and Sophie. Uh, I mean, you have been uh, both very much involved from the beginning in the uh, development of this agenda from slightly different perspectives. Um, Ashaleke, you were involved from a more activist and person on the ground perspective. Uh, and Sophie, you saw this from a more bureaucratic perspective. Uh, so Ashaleke, maybe I'll start with you. Um, you know, tell us a little bit, why did this agenda came about? And, um, you know, what did you do in this UN working group on youth and peace building? Um, thank you very much. And uh, I must say it's a huge pleasure for us to talk about uh, the Security Council resolution because it's for the first time young people were officially recognized as ambassadors of peace and change and not agents of violence. It's very, very important. And uh, it, 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 was, um, it has been a journey um, six, seven years ago, and uh, a group of young people with um, a mentorship from the older generation within uh, UNY, the United uh, Network of Young Peace Builders, was leading this bringing youth voices from, from the grassroots to legitimize this, this, this call. Uh, because we, we find ourselves in, a, in, in an era where young people have been increasingly described as troublemakers. Uh, but sometimes we don't look at the majority of young people who do not engage themselves in violence. So this resolution was about uh, for us to advocate from the grassroots by young people. I think that's the first thing which is very important. It was a youth voice to say, um, it, it is time for us to be seen differently. And we want something which gives us uh, uh, a roadmap for us to engage more effectively for us to do things more concretely. Uh, and fortunately, uh, the Women, Peace, and Security agenda had been passed, and it was a great inspiration. And uh, so at the beginning of this 2013, we had um, the UN Guiding Principles on Young People's Participation in Peace Building. These actually sparked this conversation to say, OK, well, young people could do something uh, much concretely. And in 2015, we had the first global forum on youth peace and security in Amman, Jordan. And I had the opportunity to participate in this, in this gathering. And it was an amazing eye opener because I had the opportunity to connect with other young people who are doing an amazing job. And we were all there and we said, we should come up with a youth statement. And over 11,000 young people were consulted globally. And we came up with the Amman Declaration on Youth Peace and Security, which was the measurable step. It was a roadmap. And we told ourselves, we cannot have this measured declaration by young people and the communities do not feel it. So as a young person who, who connects between local community and works at the, at the international scene, it was part of the mandate that we had. We had to go back home to talk about it, to reflect around it. So we had several consultations across the globe, and, but there was a need for something more concrete. And uh, in, in the process of these, the whole conversation of young people and preventing violent extremism was very, very important. And I remember I was invited for the White House Summit to counter violent extremism and uh, the silent the UN General Assembly, and we were reflecting on what could we do more concretely. And after a youth summit, which was organized by Search for Common Ground and other partners, we came up with a youth action agenda to prevent violent extremism and promote peace. So this brought in a new perspective where we were not just looking at government, but we're looking at government, looking at you know, the business class, we are looking at the media, we are looking at young people. What are the commitments that we can bring to the table to ensure that we, we invest, we support young people, we partner with them. 
And fortunately, at the same time, we had the SDGs that was cooking up, and Go 16 actually looked at this, this critical issue of young people. And from there, and I remember when we had the advocacy meetings, and we were meeting with our stakeholders within the Security Council, and some of them would ask us, why do we give you a Security Council resolution? And then they would turn to us and say, Christian and, and the others, tell them what you do on the grassroots. And when we share with them stories that we do, and, and for them to understand that our organizations actually work below 10,000 US dollar, and we are able to do such impact, it means something is missing. And that's why I think the missing piece was inspired, because we were not given the support that we needed. And now we're asking for a resolution. We're asking for a document which will legally put us at the top and for us to get to work and for us to be partner with governments. And we, we talked about this evidence and, and that was when we went back home. But we were very, very positive because we had the older generation to support us. And on the, uh, in December 2015, then we had the resolution saying that young people are at the forefront of the peace building process and to prevent violent extremism. I think it's a huge inspiration because it came from young people. And since then, we, we, we don't see any need to rest. We are calling our governments to take okay, action. We'll, we'll talk about since. <laughs> Thank so you. Um, you said, you know, we wanted to go to the UN Security Council because we were inspired with, by the Women, Peace and Security agenda, uh, which uh, went to the Security Council back in 2000. Um, and uh, you actually followed the playbook of the Women, Peace and Security quite well. You also had a very important uh, champion that was Jordan uh, and the crown prince who was a very important uh, ally. So going to the Security Council, you know, provided maybe a sense of urgency and priority to the issue. Uh, but Sophie, how, how did it look from the more bureaucratic point of view, from UN women? So I think what's very interesting is that there's a lot of parallels and echoes between the two agendas and the two processes. So when you think about what women started um, in trying to get a place at the table in trying to get these resolutions within the Security Council was the aim to change a mindset around understanding women as solely victims or passive um, people. And then on the other side, you have the youth agenda who, by trying to uh, get this discussion going, try to also address another stereotype, that of youth being linked to violence. So both agendas are trying to go in changing a discourse, changing a narrative, and from there give agency. Both agendas are about participation, inclusion, um, and protection. And the process in many ways is similar because of um, the idea of bringing people together for a common cause that is sustainable peace. But the challenges are also echoing each other. And what I found interesting in the development of the YPS agenda is that a lot of the people were actually coming to UN Women saying, what can we learn from the Women, Peace and Security agenda? What challenges have you been facing in implementing that agenda. The first resolution, 1325, was in 2000. We're over 15 years later, the progress is noticeable, but it's still very limited. So how can we ensure that the Youth, Peace and Security agenda has this, builds on this momentum to actually move forward and, 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 and not just be words and not action? So. We had a lot of these discussions, both with the Youth, Peace and Security Progress Study team, steering committee, youth, UN uh, peace building group, events, and in the end, a lot of the discussion was the worry that by creating categories, by creating agendas um, that are such as the Women, Peace and Security and Youth, Peace uh, Security agendas, we might be limiting, in a way, um, the action by having categories that are considered by actors as subcategories. So 
the risk there and that we've learned from the Women, Peace and Security agenda and gender inclusion in general is that it's always something that we leave for later if we have time or later if we have money. The Youth, Peace and Security agenda should not get into that challenge as well. But then we should also be careful in our language that that positioning that we put for women and youth does not come across in the resolutions, in the, in the policy documents, etc. as we talk about young people and women and other marginalized groups, or we talk about women and youth in peace and security. So we're already categorizing everyone through these groups. And the risk that we found out by talking with young women is that by doing that, actually young women in the peace and security sphere fall in between these two agendas. And they are doubly discriminated against, both by their age and their sex. So the youth peace and security agenda has to, has to absolutely make sure that gender, a gender lens is applied across, that young women are considered equally as young men in decision making and any other processes. And similarly, the women peace and security agenda has to increasingly implement an age lens. So these two kind of recommendations is, is something that we were really putting forward to make sure that these young women do not fall in between the gaps because youth in the end in the peace and security sphere like women in the peace and security sphere youth are considered as often young men and associated with violence and young women and women as victims so how do we change that narrative and how do we make sure that these two agendas are intersectional okay let me stop you there and we'll we'll come back to some of the challenges because I want to indeed, um, you know, dig a little bit deeper. When, you, when we talk about youth and young people, what actually do we mean, Nadia? Uh, shed some light on this issue. I know you have, uh, you have looked at this issue. So yeah. well, uh, I'm asking Nadia, Nadia and I'll come I'm back to you. Yeah. Of, of course, so um, when, we, when we look at uh, the resolution 2250, it gives the definition of young people as 18 to 29. Um, it uses a flexible definition, of course, because you have different cultural factors um, and understanding the transition from being a young person to a full-fledged adult really differs depending on the national context. It also dif differs depending on the regional context. We see that um, even like the African Union, they use a definition of everybody under 35 is a young person. Um, it, it really varies, and, but I think the key thing that we learn from that is very much like gender, youth is a social construct. Yeah, I think that is a very important point you're making. Uh, Hussein, how, how do you define youth in, in your work? Well, and in, in, in Emirates Foundation, we define youth who are aged between 15 to 35. Based on a research that we found out that this segment from 15 to 35 are half of the uh, nationals, or half of the local population, which is around uh, 430,000. And that research was done in 2012. Um, so the definition of the youth today, especially the Emiratis, who are between 15 to 35, and all the projects that we do deliver to the Emiratis uh, or non-Emiratis even, are six programs that are uh, uh, developed to mobilize the capabilities of youth in a way and enhance their skills in different fields. So. Starting with, for example, Tekatif, which is a voluntary program, and we develop or uh, develop the culture of giving and finding volunteer, voluntary opportunities for the youth to be engaged in. Uh, plus, we have uh, SANID, which is also an interactive uh, training program on the crisis management and a national response, uh, emergency response. Uh, we have uh, Israf Sah, which means spend right, and it's focused on financial literacy uh, training. Let me ask you a little yes. bit later about your, your literacy program, yes. because I think that's sure. very important. 
But the point I think we want to make, get across is that uh, a lot of organizations, international, national organizations, think tankers, researchers, uh, when they think use, they think in terms of age. Yeah. And that is actually maybe not such a great way to think about youth. Um, I mean, Nadia mentioned that youth is actually, you know, this transition from being a child uh, to becoming an adult. And so that transition is always different you know, depending on where you are, in what situation you are, yeah. in conflict situations, that transition might actually go f much faster. Um, and so that transition is sort of socially defined and also defined by your environment and your context. Absolutely, well, that's, that's right. It, it has specific criteria. It's not only the, the age part on it. However, here in the in, in United Arab Emirates, we are a very, uh, I would say, young country and, and, and a small population of Emiratis. And if you, if you think about it, uh, um, the youth minister even started before a few years back. And in, even Emirates Foundation, we started operating in 2008. We needed more data to know about the youth. We needed to, to learn what are their demands, what are their needs, what environments they are living in, what we, how we can support them. And it takes time to progress and find research and data and all of that. Therefore, we are very much lucky that we, are, we will be having very much soon, either by end of this year or first quarter of 2019, a youth in index research that will have a full comprehensive data about the youth in the United Arab Emirates uh, and about the women, about the children, who are, but the, the, the youth again who are aged between 15 to 35. That will also support us in customizing the initiatives, the projects, even the curriculum, the national curriculum and the educational curriculum that could be also customized more after finding more information about the youth. So I think uh, we are on the right track uh, by going by the age definition in the meantime with the government agenda. However, it takes time also to find more data, more information that will support to in, in customizing uh, good initiatives and better initiatives. Yes, yeah, so I, I think the index is a fantastic uh, initiative, and that was also one of the things that came out in the study uh, that was done on the contributions of youth. That is actually the lack of data and research, and that we need more data and research. Um, Sophie, are there any other kind of things that in that study that was released, in particular, I think the longer study, that was released just this month that struck you as uh, you know, particularly important and maybe there have also been some course corrections, I think, particularly in terms of uh, integrating a gender perspective in, in these issues. Sorry, you mean the youth progress yes. study? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in the process of the youth uh, progress study, the process itself tried to be gender sensitive in, uh, I think there was about five, more than 5,000 young people consulted. They made sure that there was gender equal and that there were also focus groups dedicated to young women as they might feel more comfortable talking about certain issues. The study itself um, tries to mainstream gender and has some gender specific sections. I think what's important now is to think about localization and often when we talk about policy documents um, or even age categories, um, we need to go beyond that in terms of implementation. And, and it's something that we also see in the PBE agenda. Terms, concepts, when we apply them, have to be customized, have to be implemented with both a context-specific lens and uh, the feedback of the people who are going to implement it. So in this particular agenda, the youth peace and security agenda, we have to make sure that 
in designing programs or in designing policies at the national level, we bring voices from young people, including young women, um, at the table and make sure that they can design not only the project itself, but also the monitoring uh, um, mechanisms to make sure that there's accountability, an ac accountability system um, uh, that can be traced back as well. And then you mentioned the research. I think that's like one of the biggest challenges that we had. UN Women has um, also written its own paper on young women in peace and security that's going to be released, released this month. And the, the main difficulty that we found is that both in existing youth um, research, there's a big lack of a gender lens. And then within research around women, peace and security, um, we often talk about girls, but rarely that in between. And so that gap needs to be um, identified in a very precise manner to look at the different sectors where um, we want to further the implementation and use that information to design, again, specific tailored programs and policies. Mm -hmm. Nadia, do you want to add anything on this? Because I, I think we have indeed, we have to be very careful with our language. Uh, you know, often in the Women, Peace and Security, we talk about women and girls. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think young women are missed um, in our characterization of, of just looking at women and girls, or we'll just look at women as a homogeneous, you know, a homogeneous category, but that's not true. We have to look at the intersection of class, race, and other issues that make this category so important. Um, I think it's also really important to look at um, particularly how young women um, are, are included in the mainstreaming. So a lot of times we'll, we'll see women are used as a checkbox, you know, especially for policymakers um, and people who are doing a lot of programming. They'll say, okay, here's my main program. Um, and then, oh right, we have to include women in this. Oh right, we have to include girls in this, so then I'll, I'll check my box. But you need to really look at young women and include them in the, gen in the, in the general framework. Um, and then also, going back to the definition, I'm thinking of International Day of the Girl, um, that, which recently uh, happened. October and, 11th, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it just passed in. Uh, looking a lot of the media exposure, and it's great. Of course, that's something we need to focus on, but I saw that a lot of the, the posts and the programming, they were talking about young women. And I think that's really a key in our confusion. We'll confuse girls, and then, you know, we really need to take these categories and understand them and give them merit to, you know, to what they are. Yes, yeah, so what you're saying, language and these def definitions really matter because if you don't have a clear idea of your definition, your target is going to be very confused uh, and your program is going to be very confused. So I think that's a very good point. Now, in this uh, study, and I, I really encourage all of you to have a look at this study because mm. we might have some you know, critiques, as we always do on, on study, but it's, it's really uh, quite a, a very good study and raises a lot of good, good questions. One of the things that is emphasized is the importance of education and economic effort, opportunities. Ashaleke, in terms of education, I think you do also a lot of peer-to-peer -peer education. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, um, I think um, education and, um, and uh, the financial opportunity is very important. And it's about creating a safe space for young people. And uh, in our case, we currently work in prisons, and uh, I shared this earlier. Uh, but I think it's the first thing which makes what we do a bit different is that peer to peer educator uh, program where we believe that young people connect much more better. Um, so we engage within the space. So um, we designed a program which is called Creative Skills for Peace program where we work in prisons uh, in Cameroon basically because the whole idea was inspired by my personal story where I was given an opportunity to become better. And uh, a lot of my peers were thrown to jail because of violence. And uh, we came to understand that within the milieu they find themselves in the prison facility, you know, the lack of quality and the access to education is very limited. And, you know, what can actually give them hope, it's missing. 
So we designed this project to provide an alternative to violence. And by alternative, we're looking at both formal and non-formal education. And uh, we train these young people in prison on vocational skills, on entrepreneurship development. And we have educational programs like inter-AC pr uh, prison competitions, where we have young boys and young girls mm -hmm. engaged in AC competitions. And they share their views on, about their lives, about their crimes, and what they want to become. And one amazing thing which we, we came to understand is, you know, uh, despite uh, the history of violence, they need an opportunity to become better. And in providing them these opportunities for skills, we design what we call the, in, the, the, the uh, uh, Prison Entrepreneurship Award to award young entrepreneurs. We, we, we need to brand them. We need to, to make them see life differently. And I came here today with, with some samples of what they do because I believe a lot about evidence and if we want to change perspectives. So for example, they are engaged in a lot of activities. For example, we have, these are flip flops which they produce and as you can see, it's packaged, it is labeled, and it gives class. It's made in prison, and they call themselves prisonpreneurs. And actually, they have been captured by international press. They're into fashion designing. We have a prison orchestra, and they do a lot of issues. But the whole idea is to educate them towards financial empowerment and also to free them from you know, post-traumatic disorder, to, uh, you know, to reflect mm -hmm. around mental health issues and to see how they can be very creative. Because from what we've understood is, you just need to give them a goal and they are good to go. And we've seen that and today their products are consumed both uh, nationally and internationally. And every day we call on the world to support them much more mm -hmm. uh, because they have bank accounts and uh, to ensure that by the time they go out, they can be received by their communities and they start their own businesses and they can become better people. So that's what we do for Concrete Work. Thank you very much. Hussein, you are also very much at the intersection of education and providing economic opportunities and you do a lot of important programs in terms of financial literacy. Yeah. Uh, you know, what are some of the, the lessons that you have learned in these programs? with some of the good and some of the bad in terms of the programs here in the UAE and, and some of the things we might apply elsewhere? Yeah. Well, I think um, the financial uh, crisis, which was in 2007, taught us everything about like how, how you need to manage your financial uh, spending habits or behavior. And it was a big lesson to everyone. Um, However, it's now 11 years from the financial crisis, and, and you will find few countries only across the world that they do have financial literacy in their curriculums, or they are started teaching their kids, or starting teaching the youth at the universities or colleges. Uh, and it's a very essential habit, or a very essential tool or a skill that the youth need to gain it. Um, so when we started in 2013 in, in, in Emirates Foundation delivering financial literacy, we wanted just uh, to test to see how the schools are accepting us and how the universities are accepting us. You wouldn't believe it that in first year we have delivered for over 16,000 people just awareness. And we thought that we need to create now or develop a content. We need to change behavior. And the lessons that we have learned is, is you just need to keep reminding people the importance of having skills on financial literacy. You need to be, uh, advise them always how they need to save, how they need to spend well, uh, how they need to share in the right time, and plus how they need to set up goals. They need to have a smart goals that they can really push themselves to start saving or investing or even spending, but in the right direction. And also take a responsibility. We, in our community, for example, we don't control the kids uh, if they need something from the market. We always just get things, whatever they want. No, we need to be more accountable and we need to teach them how to be more accountable. The parents today, they need to, to do this. 
the youth, they need to control their spending and less uh, uh, luxury things. They need to differentiate between what they want, what they need. Uh, the bad things, which, or I wouldn't say the bad things, but the, the wrong habits that might, might we face today, uh, people take it, uh, they don't take the loan very seriously. They don't take having more than one credit card seriously. They think it, okay, I will get, I will get my, my salary by end of the month and I will cover the payments that I do need to have. However, that's affecting your lifestyle, that's affecting your future, that's affecting any goal that you have set up to reach. And also securing for your kids a good life. Today, the big advice that we need to, that we are sharing with everyone in, in, our, in our training, in our interactive sessions, we tell people how to become, how they need to have a financial confidence. There is something called financial confidence. They need to be in very productive zone. They need to, to be out from burnout zone where they cannot control at all any, any financial they do have. So financial confidence is very essential to have, but wouldn't happen if you don't have the right tools to reach to that direction. Okay, thank you. I want to go back out to the audience as well, um, and you know, if you have questions or some comments, uh, keep it brief. Uh, state your name and your affiliation. Uh, before we go to the audience, though, one uh, last question, maybe for uh, Sophie, uh, and you know, I want the other panelists to think about this as well. We have now created the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, the Youth, Peace, and Security Agenda. In the Security Council, we also have something that is called Protection of Civilians. Uh, we have an agenda that is about children in conflict. Uh, we have the SDGs, which is the huge agenda. How do we make sure that we connect these agenda to each other and that they're not sort of in their own silos what I often see is that, you know, the women, peace, and security people talk to the women, peace, and security people. The SDG people talk to the SDG people. The youth people talk to the youth people. The children people talk to. So how do we get people and policymakers and policy and institutions to come with a more integrated approach? Sophie. Um, what are we doing at the UN level in this regard? Or do you have a suggestion for the Secretary General in this regard? So I think you raise a very important point. And, and it's something that even in the design of the Youth, Peace and Security Agenda, it was a concern that came about. Um, how do we make sure that these agendas then become silos and that they become a competition between the two for funding? It's a space that's extremely limited and funding to youth and funding to women is extremely limited in the peace and security area. So how do we make sure that they can be complementary, how they can work together and not compete for spaces? Um, I think obviously like in terms of you were saying also the other agendas, it's important that we make sure that the indicators for each of these agendas are cross-cutting across them and that this base of, of data can be used um, for the implementation of it all. And it's important to not think of an agenda being something, a restricted um, a portfolio that has to go towards something, but it's, it's a bridge towards reaching out to some people that might not have access to that funding or support within a larger common goal. And, and it's important that we make sure that these bridges are not in parallel, but actually they, they overlap and they work together. And so within, like in terms of programming, what, what this means, at least within UN Women, is, is what we are trying to do is make sure that young women and women organizations, youth organizations speak to each other and, and build on each other's knowledge and, and, and partner. And this has been extremely useful in, in working for peace. So in our programs where we support uh, women's capacity building and access to peace processes, we also talk 
to youth groups and young women, and we try to understand what youth groups who want to also be part of that conversation, like women, can learn from women's strategies. Women have been extremely active, and, and it has been documented in comparison to youth, because youth have been active as well, but it hasn't been yet as documented as the, the, the women experience. So what can we learn from quotas, from um, advisory board mechanisms, from forums and platforms that are created for women dialogue? And, and that connection with the, the policy level. So what, can, what has worked, what were the limitations, and how youth groups can integrate that within their own sphere and space. So I think maybe one of the bigger challenge that we saw within the Women, Peace, and Security agenda is that whenever you um, try to create a space um, for women at the table, and that's something that was discussed in the forum this morning, you kind of want to tick a box, and so you try to make one woman come and you put her at the table or you put her in the back and, and you, you tick that box. And it's something that we've heard before a lot and, and, and that we, we have to make sure that it doesn't happen um, in the future. And so looking at what kind of mechanisms women have used to avoid that and, and, and emphasize a meaningful participation and not just a physical participation is something that youth organizations can learn from as well, and vice versa. Women organization might also benefit from youth organizations in their mobilization strategies. So a lot of our work looks also at how in Mali, for instance, women um, have partnered with youth organization to mobilize around the peace agreement. In Libya, um, young women and uh, women are working towards, uh, together towards building a campaign for peace. So this is extremely valuable, and, and that complementary, complementarity between the agenda is the strength, and it's the strength towards inclusivity. Any other idea? Uh, you want to comment? Yes, yes. I think uh, one thing which is very important, and we've been trying to push that harder within the peace and security agenda, is the formation of coalitions. And uh, uh, you, you might call it interagency working group, you might call it multi-stakeholder, but it's about forming coalitions at national and global level with people from all walks of life. I, I guess you agree with me that uh, peace building is a collective process. And it's not a process for only peace building organizations. And we miss this point every day, especially around young people. And that's why in our programming, uh, for example, we, we've started engaging uh, young influencers in the peace building process, be it in entrepreneurship development, because if you look at it clearly, the lack of jobs actually pushes young people to violence. So a young person who provides job opportunity is actually solving one of the drivers of violence. If you look at a woman that works on maybe gender-based violence, it's actually solving one of the drivers. So it has to be multi-sectorial. I think if we are to recommend, it's not really recommended, but it's to ask you know, the UN to ask our governments who actually signed these agreements to understand that they need to support young people within the space and every other stakeholder to create this multi-stakeholder approach. Because if we have young people who are into entertainment, for example, their influencers have a voice. If, for example, we have Cristiano Ronaldo in a conversation on youth peace and security, it's going to speak a lot of volumes, but we don't, we don't get to see them. We only want to get activists in this conversation. So if I think we could get you know, UN agencies, you could get women agencies, you could get from climate change to everything together, we would understand that peace building is a collective process and every effort that we are engaged in, it's a building block towards peace. I think it's something which we need to promote and uh, we've tried it at local level and it actually works. Yeah, I think your point of coalitions and partnerships is very important and Ahmed, I think uh, that is true, you know, civil society is very important in this regard and think tanks and research institutes. So I want to open it up. Um, raise your hand if you want to make a comment or ask a question. Uh, state your name, your affiliation, and maybe stand up so that we can see you. Sure. Because the lights are very bright. Well, well uh, uh, my name is Phil Dufty. I'm from the Emirates Diplomatic Academy. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the panelists for this uh, fascinating discussion and to uh, Trends for organizing this great event. 
Um, with the chair's permission, I'll uh, risk uh, asking two quick questions, if I may. Um, yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, the, the first is really about this interesting discussion about the kind of risk of box ticking, you know, having the, the, the token woman, the token youth um, in, involved in peace processes. Um, and I think one aspect that's come out very strongly in your discussion is the question of how you make sure that's meaningful participation in the peace processes. But my question is around how you, how you make sure you've chosen the right youth and the right women. And there was, I was involved in a discussion about this the other day, and that risk that, in a sense, the, the youth and the women that are participating in those peace processes are just reinforcing existing power structures or representing existing power structures in, in that society. Um, so that's my question number one. Question number two is around this question of capacity building and training, and it's something we're interested in from the, uh, as we train, train diplomats in, in our academy. Um, but it's around, if you could tell me a bit about the existing ecosystem, particularly in this region, for doing training for people who are participating in peace processes, whether youth or women or others, um, and you know, who's providing that training, um, how adequate is it, um, et cetera. That would be very interesting to me. Okay, great. Any other questions or you still want to think? Yeah, please, the gentleman in the back. Thank you. My name is Marius Sajongak. I'm from Cameroon. I work uh, in the UAE, in Abu Dhabi. My question is, uh, I've heard so many interesting things, some of which I didn't know before, and I want to thank the organizers of this. Uh, as a youth, I think I'm learning so much already. But at the level of the UN, at the level of governments of different countries, my question is, what is the relationship that the UN, these governments have with the media? Because with the communication background that I have, uh, we do not see some of these things on the media. For example, the, the peace talk, the violence talk. What we see on CNN today, on BBC today, on Al Jazeera, is US election, is uh, what is happening in Afghanistan. And some of these things, even when we get the youth, which we're talking about, get exposed to this, they somehow, uh, somehow get to be afraid. Like, am I safe where I am? What, where do I get the solution? So I think there should be some sort of partnership, some sort of coalition relationship on the media and these governments and these UN uh, bodies so that we should mind what we also broadcast, we should mind what we show to people because in some sort I think that there is some discouragement. So my question is, uh, is there a sort of dialogue, is there a sort of planning that is done at the UN uh, level to see that the media talk about this piece. We need to see it more on the papers, on the radio talked about it, and on the TV. I think when children watch the TV, when they watch the radio, uh, sorry, when they watch TV, listen to radio, and read, even in educational curricula, I think that this is a contribution somehow to building this piece. Because if we keep talking it here, the child that is uh, raised in my village will not know this. I think we should use the media to the least level, which is the radio, I strongly believe, to communicate these things. Thank you so much. Thank you for, thank you for your question, and the role of the media is indeed key. And any media who is here, I say, you know, write a story about this. Um, any other questions before I go to the panel? Well, we'll, we'll come back to you. So. Um, the first uh, question was actually three questions. I, <laughs> who wants to go first? Maybe on the issue of uh, you know, box ticking, meaningful participation. How to make sure that you have the right youth? I mean, Nadia, you were talking about this. Yeah, so I, I think um, that really, it's important in my context to understand the right youth. Um, I think, of course, you have to seek qualified candidates, um, and they are out there, and I, and I see this a lot in my um, professional organization. So yes, you have to seek the qualified candidates, but it's also recognizing a lot of times our definition of who's qualified is heavily dependent on our um, ideas of professionalism or um, these, 
these elite criteria that we put in place that a lot of other uh, young women who are facing a lot of these structural barriers can't, um, can't achieve because we haven't um, put our hand out and, and given them the opportunity to. So I think that speaks a lot to um, the recruitment process and understanding who you're reaching out to. I see this in my context a lot because um, even in my campus, I do admit I'm from the United States, um, I go to a private institution, so even with that, there's a lot of barriers that go into it. Um, and then so during our recruitment process, we really found that it's only, it's, it's only targeted a lot of the elite young people on campus um, and that we see as like the right youth, you know, the right candidates. Um, but really looking at our recruitment process, we found that um, professionalism was one of the most racialized words used. We would use, you know, it's, it's kind of like dog whistle politics. Like you use these words that are, that don't seem harmful at first, but when you really dig into it, um, you, you see the underlying drivers, well, professionalism, okay, well, you're looking, you're judging their outfit or something, and um, they might not have had the opportunity to have their resume looked over by somebody. Um, so I think in terms of selecting uh, the right youth, you need to, yes, seek out qualified candidates, but then also do your part and reaching out your hand and making sure that you include everybody at the table. Um, because if we're talking about meaningful participation and inclusive participation of everybody, that's really the idea of intersectionality, right? And looking at how all of these different factors come together and seeing how we can pick the best candidate who also has different perspectives and all of these perspectives are valid. Hussein, in terms of capacity building, yeah. uh, do you have a good sense of what the existing ecosystem is out there? Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, but before that, I would like to add something also regarding the, the youth, how we select the right candidate. I think everyone is qualified here. From our experience at Emirates Foundation dealing with youth, we believe that everyone is qualified as much as you to give them the opportunity to be part of something and engage to be and contributed or even to enhance their skills in a certain area. Uh, as much as you control and, 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 and give them the right uh, space, they will be qualified to be engaged and be productive in the community. Yes, of course, there is some niche segment of youth that are talented, and therefore we do develop for them specific initiatives that related to their talents and direction on that. Yes, the ecosystem here today, uh, this was the question about the ecosystem and training, right? Or, yeah? Yes. Yes, uh, I think uh, we have amazing uh, ecosystem for the training. Uh, there is a great collaboration between private and public sector across UAE in delivering uh, free of cost even uh, training to the youth and developing their skills and making the, or mobilizing their capabilities in different fields across UAE. Um, and I think um, and the government is, and it's very essential and it is one of the government agenda to have always uh, uh, youth being engaged and having the, the right training. And everyone, if you have noticed now, most of the government entities, they, they focus on uh, trainings, delivering for the youth. It might be centralized. For example, in Abu Dhabi today here, Abu Dhabi government is introducing uh, training for the employees in different uh, ages. They do on different grades. And I assume also in Dubai there is happening the same. Um, today, the support that you get from the government entities, if you are a potential entrepreneur, if you are in human rights, if you are in any sector that you are, you will have the right training. And I think we are very much lucky to have such atmosphere and environment in the UE that, that everyone is, is can, get, can be trained and be enhanced. Uh, Sophie and Ashley, if the, in terms of this capacity building, Sophie, you know, looking at it from a global international perspective, do you think we have a good handle on what the ecosystem of capacity building is? 
uh, internationally, globally? Do we have what, sorry? Do we have a good handle? Do we really know what is going on? It seems to me that often the right hand doesn't really know what the left hand is doing, and there's a lot of programs out there. Um, um, yes, I mean, so I'm gonna try and also answer the, the three questions because I think they're all quite interlinked. And we, you mentioned the selection and, and how does that process take place? And you both mentioned qualifications and that everyone is qualified. I think that's our like standing point. Everyone is qualified. Whether you want to work on finance or on a peace process, someone might not have that knowledge because they might not have access to it. So when we talk about capacity building and, and any kind of programming, the selection process has to take into account the diversity of backgrounds, the diversity of access to that information, and make sure that we reach out not only to the usual suspects, but make sure we can reach out to other young people, other women who might be in more remote areas, extremely qualified, building peace, um, uh, uh, mediating conflict within their communities, and yet who don't have that link to the global level. So I think UN Women is extremely well positioned in both working with civil society, women, and young people, and a kind of more track one diplomatic global policy level. And, and, and a lot of our work is trying to, to bridge these through channels, uh, which is in a way also through capacity building to make sure that you know, language which likes 1325, it's, it's, it's so conceptual when you talk to someone who's negotiating humanitarian access in a remote area. So how do we, how do we make sure that these systems are able to feed into each other and that the local can influence the global? Um, the other question was about um, the relationship with Oh, so you might go into that afterwards, but... Uh, briefly. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, that, I mean, the link with the relationship with the media, that was an, uh, another right. question, mm -hmm. is, I think, very important. And, and within our work, for instance, we uh, do capacity training for journalists in the region about gender-specific issues related to conflict and peace and security. Because, as you mentioned, in the media, we end up seeing a lot of about the violence. And when you look at the images, a lot of these images are um, either uh, men with guns or women uh, as victims from the conflict. And so we're trying to make sure that the media is able to bring voices um, in its diversity, but also show the positive contributions that both young people and women bring to these areas by building peace at the community level. Uh, so this goes through trainings, uh, at least within uh, UN Women, I know other UN agencies are also doing that, and changing the narratives. It brings us back to the discussion constantly about fighting these stereotypes, educating both the media and other people around these stereotypes to make sure we can change the narrative. Yes. Any other questions, comments from the floor? I'll give it back to you. No, then I'll go back to the panel, and um, and you can, uh, Shalik, if you want to uh, answer, uh, you know, the last question. I think the role of the media is indeed important, and it be he holds behooves all of us uh, who are active in these spaces to make it accessible to people. Indeed, if you're talking, you know, talking about resolution 1325 or 2250, you're not going to convince people with that kind of thing. So we need to translate this into plain English or plain Arabic or plain French. Um, so I think that is a very important uh, point. But Last question I want to ask all of you and, and, you know, just take a minute. If you had a magic wand, what is the sort of single most important thing that you would like to see happen or that you would like to do? And I'm starting with you, Ashaleke, because I think you have actually thought about this um, quite a bit. So I start with you and I go down the, the row here. 
Okay. You have the magic wand. <laughs> Here it is. So, but before I go to that, I would like to react to uh, some of the questions. I think uh, when we talk about selecting the right persons, we should ask ourselves if we've created the right space to give opportunity for people to learn where you can identify persons. Because um, working within the space of government, we see the situation where the space for young people is being shrinked, it's been tied up, it's closed, so you cannot identify the right person. So I'm sure that if we create the right space, you'll be able to identify the right person. And the kind of things which are important, have we promoted volunteerism to get a job that asks for two years of experience? But the countries have not provided platforms or promoted volunteerism, which is very important. So I think we need to reflect on some of these policies which we have first before we talk about, oh, we see the same people every day on the same panel or talking about the same thing. Let's try to create this space. I think around media, it is very, very important because I would like to share a personal experience. Uh, on the prison project that we are working on, BBC did a report on it. And after that report on it, you know, we've had many other countries who want to reflect around reforming the prison system, many other young people inspired because they, they, they did not believe that even when you're in prison, you could, be, you could be resourceful. And even to the young people that were transforming their lives because they were captured on BBC, it was a huge inspiration. Now they are heroes within their spaces. So I think the media has a key role to play to, to put the right message out there because it does not just uh, change the world, but it inspires and change perspective and it can influence government policy. And if there's one magic word to say, usually I don't have one because I speak on behalf of 1.8 billion young people as, as a youth representative, but I think there's one thing that we have to do. I think our government must partner, invest, and we do this together. I think those are, uh, they are words though, but I think it's very important for us to do it together. Thank you. Thank you. Sophie? Okay, so maybe a little bit of a justification background about the thinking. And it goes back to, again, the question of selection <laughs> and ticking the box. I think what we learn from the Women, Peace and Security agenda is that when we look at selection or at participation, we look at mechanisms such as quotas. And the risk sometimes with quotas is that you end up selecting people based on maybe their age or their sex to be there and present and tick that box. So selection is, I think, both a tricky word in the sense that it already has the idea of we are selecting so we are discriminating maybe others. So maybe we can talk instead of rep representation and making sure that the people who are present um, represent and, and uh, uh, a group or a voice or a concern or a demand and, and that representation is fundamental to having that channel constantly link back to the community level and forth. I don't think we can achieve a sustainable peace if, if that these channels between the local, the national and the global are not uh, constantly accessible by all. Um, so that brings me to the magic wand and um, I don't think I can speak um, on behalf of, of young people or women. I think we all have our particular concerns, challenges, demands, depending on our context, our experiences. Um, so I think what I would aim for is um, uh, a secured and safe space for dialogue between all, and when I mean all is on an equal foot. Um, because voices can also differ. Young people might not agree all between each other. Women might not agree all between each other, and that's fine, and that's respectable. So I think what we have to aim for would be that space where people feel comfortable and um, free to share their concerns, their ideas, uh, and from there build together a common goal. Hussein? Well, uh I think that the magic part would be that uh, the youth should have the passion. The passion is very important today, uh, especially if you, are, if you are living in a land of opportunities and everything is, is, is available for you. It uh, doesn't matter the gender, the age, and all of that, but if you have the right passion, you can track whatever you, know, 
whatever you want. Plus, as uh, accountable entities, they need also to define the youth passion, what they do need, which is very important to be here today, which is very important to be in the youth circles from the minister and also other initiatives that across the world that define the youth passion, that then you would know what kind of opportunities they were looking for, what they can chase. Nadia, you have one second. Yeah. <laughs> um, for, for me, if I had a magic wand um, to, to do something, it would be uh, to make sure that people understand that empowerment starts at home. Um, and I see that a lot with my mother, and she was um, born in a conflict setting, as I said at the forum. Um, I'm a first generation Haitian American, and, and she was um, growing up under the Duvalier regime, and, uh, she said, and you know, I asked her, you know, her life now, and I'm like, it feels like a lifetime ago. How did you get through it? You know, what did you do? And she always tells me it's because she had one person who empowered her, who believed her, who said that she had a voice and who loved her. And we see this again with, like, for example, Malala Yousafzai. We see that she talks about her father. How did she get through these things? It's her father that empowered her. So that really reinforces the role of mentorship. So if you're looking out there and saying, what can I do tomorrow? You know, what can I do? You can start at home. And if you're somebody who's more established, look at a young person and say, give them that power. Give them that mentorship opportunity and tell them that you believe them, value them, and love them. Thank you very much. Well, I think you will agree with me. This was a fantastic panel. Uh, the last, you know, pieces of advice from the panelists were it's all about partnerships, investing, being together, being respectful of each other, uh, something that's particularly important, I think, in politics these days, and in particular in the country in which I live, uh, where that often seems to have left the window. Um, and then, Hussein, you also talked about passion and we all need to keep our youthful spirit. And in Dubai, there is this fantastic youth hub. Uh, it's a beautiful space, and Nadia and I, we visited. And at first I thought, well, maybe I don't belong here because I'm not, no longer in this category. But then it says, you know, open to all youth, including those with youthful spirit. So I uh, wish all of us to have useful spirit and to keep useful spirit. So thank you so much for your uh, interventions here. And please join me in thanking them.